What kind of life lived in the ocean after the largest extinction event of all time? After our beloved trilobites had gone extinct? Today I'm going to be talking about just that, from invertebrate animals to vertebrate animals to sea monster type animals that lived during this time in Earth's history, and we'll talk about their recovery after that extinction event and why it was slower than maybe it should have been. So the early Mesozoic, or the time just after the end Permian mass extinction, or the Great Dying as it was called, includes the periods the Triassic and Jurassic. The Triassic and Jurassic combined went from around 200 152 million years ago, right at the Permian Triassic boundary, to around 145 million years ago. So we're talking about this about 100 million year period in this video, and I talk about the Cretaceous in a series of other videos. But the major key events that we'll be going over in this video and other videos about the early Mesozoic include the recovery of devastated animals after the Great Dying, the repeated extinctions that occurred after the Great Dying. So in the Triassic, there were major extinctions, and I'm not just talking about the late Triassic extinctions that is one of the big five mass extinctions in the Phanerozoic Eon. I'm talking about other mass extinctions in addition to this in the early Triassic that slowed recovery of organisms, and I'll talk about that in this video. We'll also talk about things like sea monsters or marine predators that resembled what we call sea monsters today, or the Loch Ness Monster, for example. And we'll also talk about crocodiles, for example, but these are just kind of a few of the things to come. And also, I don't have it listed here, but the first turtles, which I I love turtles, so that was a huge event that happened, but a whole bunch of other organisms we'll go over in this video. And then other major events that happened in this time frame were on land, like tropical land plants that aided the evolution of the very first mammals and dinosaurs. And then, of course, the end Triassic mass extinction. But I'll talk about these two things, land animals in the early Mesozoic, as well as the Triassic extinction, in separate videos videos, since they're both topics that deserve their own video. So today we'll focus on marine life after the Great Dying. Some of the organisms that went extinct during the Great Dying and were no longer around after the Paleozoic in the Mesozoic era include our beloved trilobites, like I have here on my shirt, of course, you know, I had to wear it in honor of them. We can even see in the picture of the Paleozoic Reef down below some trilobites on the sea floor. Then also we had the loss of fusilinins, which were a type of foraminifera. I have a video all about forams uh, that I'll link up to the top right if you want to check out. They're just really cool microorganisms and a lot of them, such as fusilinids, acted as really important index fossils for the late Paleozoic. And what that means for fusilinids is that they had very distinct morphologies and they had many species that were very widespread during the time that they lived, but they only lived for very short time intervals, each one of their species. And so we use their fossils to pinpoint where we are in time in terms of Earth's history. And that's what an index fossil is. And so these guys really well represent the Carboniferous and Permian periods of the late Paleozoic and the intervals with in them if you get down to species level specificity. But the real unfortunate thing that went extinct at the end of the Paleozoic or things were corals. Both rugose and tabulate corals, the major reef builders of the Paleozoic, went extinct during the Great Dying, and this really slowed the recovery of reefs in the Mesozoic. But we'll talk later about the new reefs that did eventually evolve and spread and now play a big role in reef building on modern Earth. But there were things that flourished immediately after the Great Dying. For example, during a brief interval after the Great Dying, stromatolites and thrombolites, which are preserved microbial mats, flourished flourished because the things that stopped them from flourishing before, the grazers and the burrowers, largely declined or went extinct, allowing these microbial mats to take over the areas that were no longer inhabited by those organisms. However, this didn't last long. Again, this was a brief interval. And then later when the grazers and burrowers came back and recovered and re-diversified, of course, the microbial mats had to kind of decline once again. And that's actually the reason that modern microbial mats like this are found in somewhat hostile environments or environments that are at least hostile to grazers and burrowers that would otherwise eat them. So they kind of stay away from those guys. 
Some other things that made remarkable recoveries after the great dying include brachiopods and ammonoids. We can see some ammonoids swimming around here in the picture to the right, and although only two ammonoid genera, two small groups of ammonoids, survived the great dying event, in the early Triassic we see over a hundred genera in those rocks, which means that they diversified from two genera to over a hundred genera within just the early Triassic time interval. However, most marine life was much slower to recover, and this was due to early Triassic extinctions like I mentioned earlier. After the great dying event, life on Earth had to endure three more successive mass extinctions. And we can see some positive and negative carbon isotope excursions in this graph here to the bottom right in the lower or early Triassic. And we'll talk about that in a second because that gives us clues as to when these extinctions were and what caused them. But in terms of just confirming that these things happened, we use things like ammonoid and condonaut fossil records because these organisms were very sensitive to both favorable and unfavorable conditions, meaning that they did declined greatly during unfavorable climate environmental conditions, and they recovered greatly and diversified greatly during favorable conditions. So we can see the extinction swings very obviously or more obviously in their fossil records compared to other organisms that aren't as affected. For example, we can see the ammonoid diversity in this graph down here in the center, and if we compare it to the carbon isotope graph, we see the same time stages, or I think they're sub-stages of the Triassic over here, which we can see in DI, which I won't say the full names because I don't know how to pronounce them, uh, we can see a negative carbon isotope excursion that correlates with a drop in ammonoid diversity, and then we can see an upward swing in ammonoid diversity between DI and SM at that boundary, and we see an upward or positive carbon isotope excursion at that time. And then it goes back down, and so does aminoid diversity, etc. So these kind of help us to match up when these extinctions happened with isotope excursions. And isotope excursions are helpful for telling us what caused the mass extinctions. And that's just because carbon and oxygen isotope ratios in the rock record record climatic changes, and I'll explain how they do so in a second. Uh, what we see at these extinction events is negative excursions for both oxygen isotopes and carbon isotopes for the ocean and atmosphere. So what these negative excursions mean, or negative dips in their isotope values mean, uh, for the carbon, for example, it suggests great carbon emission during the negative excursion. And for the oxygen, it suggests higher temperatures. And let me briefly explain why that is. So for carbon, uh, because phototrophs or photosynthesizers take up very isotopically light or more negative carbon, uh, they take that up and then eventually when they become buried and preserved in the rock record, you've got preservation of very light carbon. And when there's a bunch of photosynthetic activity, they're taking up all this light carbon from the atmosphere, leaving behind pretty heavy carbon in the atmosphere for inorganic carbon containing rocks like carbonates to form with. That means that carbonates are kind of representing the atmosphere of ancient history whenever they formed in terms of their carbon isotope ratio. And so during periods of great carbon emission, you're having the emission of all the saved up light carbon from the rock record into the atmosphere, causing the atmosphere to become lighter or more negative, and therefore carbonate, carbon isotope signatures, to become lighter or more negative as well, and that causes the negative carbon isotope excursions in carbonate material. And then oxygen isotopes, their negative excursions corroborate that carbon was being emitted because they represent higher temperatures. And that's because higher temperatures mean heavier oxygen isotopes are being evaporated from the ocean and going into the atmosphere, leaving the ocean slightly lighter or more negative in oxygen. And then the shells that are forming in the ocean preserve the ocean's oxygen isotope ratio. And if it's lighter, it means that more heavy oxygen evaporated and it was a warmer period. If you didn't understand any of that, it's okay. To sum up, it just means that both of these isotopic lines of evidence suggest that there were three successive warming events in the early Triassic. Global warming was also the cause of the Great Dying, and it caused subsequent ocean stagnation and anoxia. That just means that the ocean was stagnant, not as being not being as well mixed because colder waters weren't going down to the bottom waters, bringing oxygen from the top to the bottom, and 
you weren't having as much mixing leading to deep waters that were anoxic. Additionally, more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere leads to more phototrophic activity in blooms at the surface, which lead to anoxia or lack of oxygen beneath them, and all of that contributed to the extinctions. However, global cooling actually occurred just after the Great Dying, but only in a brief interval before the warming and ocean anoxia spiked again in these three events. And these changing and unfavorable conditions were likely what caused the mass extinctions. But now that we know why recovery was slow, let's talk a little bit about the organisms that finally did recover when recovery became a little bit more quick in the mid-Triassic period. So as I mentioned earlier, tabulate and rugose corals went extinct at the Great Dying, and that caused recovery of reefs to be very slow because they were major reef builders. And so because corals were gone, the first to rebuild reefs were sponges and algae. But then as the Triassic progressed, corals eventually came back, but they were hexacorals or scleractinians. And actually these scleractinians represent all modern corals today. So after they evolved in the Triassic, they, you know, continued to evolve and diversify into the Cenozoic and to modern day. So all the corals you see in the modern ocean are scleractinians or hexacorals. Hexacorals can be solitary, just one coral or all bunched together, colonial corals. Uh, the colonial corals before in the Paleozoic were typically tabulates, and then rugose were typically solitary, uh, but could be colonial in the Paleozoic. But now we had hexacorals, which could be either. And so they were a bit more diverse and they aided in reef building. And in the mid-Triassic, they built up to three meter or around 10 feet reefs or mounds, uh, but they got much larger in the late Triassic to Jurassic. However, they grew in relatively deep waters, which is slightly different than coral reefs today. This is likely because the relationship that we see today of corals with symbiotic algae, meaning they need that algae and therefore live in environments where sunlight reaches, so pretty shallow waters, uh, that relationship probably didn't establish itself until the late Triassic or even the early Jurassic. But once established, corals did mainly grow reefs in the shallow waters, and then siliceous sponges were the ones that took over deep water reef building. Bivalves and sea urchins also greatly diversified during this time, both as surface dwellers on the seafloor as well as burrowers. And the success of these two groups of organisms, as well as hexacorals, led to a much more modern looking ocean floor than the ocean floor of the Paleozoic. However, many modern arthropods still hadn't evolved quite yet, but the group that includes crabs and lobsters today did evolve in the Jurassic. Another thing that evolved and diversified at this time were coccolithophores, which as you can see by the scale here are microorganisms, but they actually became incredibly important constituents of the rock record in the period just following the Jurassic called the Cretaceous. In fact, they were so important in the rock record of the Cretaceous, they gave that period its name. Creta means chalk, and coccolithophores are microalgae that formed blooms that, when they fell down to the sea floor, formed incredibly large deposits of chalk. And they still exist in the modern ocean, it's just that the Cretaceous had such large chalk deposits that we named it after these chalk formers. What I think is super cool about these guys is that chalk is a rock that we all know but it actually was invented by coccolithophores. Until they evolved in the Jurassic, chalk did not exist in the rock record, which is super cool. However, getting to a little bit more larger invertebrates now, we had large swimming predators like ammonoids and belemnoids. And we can see in the rock record, we can see some fossils here of an ammonite and belemnite, which is what they're called in fossil form. And then we can see some pictures of them in life here, or reconstructions of what they would have looked like. And actually, even though ammonoids lived throughout the Mesozoic era and like dominated the Mesozoic era, individual ammonoid species lived for very short time intervals, even though they were very widespread during those times. And because of their morphological distinctiveness as individual species, we can use each species as an index fossil for their specific time interval that they lived in. So just like we talked about the fusilinids as index fossils, ammonoids also acted as great index fossils for pretty much all the intervals of time in the Mesozoic era. 
Now moving on to vertebrates like fish and sharks. Ray-finned bony fish of the Paleozoic gave rise to very successful early Mesozoic forms, but they were still relatively primitive compared to modern fish. For example, they had more diamond-shaped scales rather than circular scales of fish today, and they didn't overlap quite as much as modern fish scales do, which meant they were less protective against infections and parasites. Their skeletons were also partially cartilage still rather than all bone. They had highly asymmetric tails compared to modern, more symmetrical tails, and they still had simple primitive jaws, or many of them did, and also many of them had teeth that were shaped like rounded pegs for crushing shells rather than sharper teeth. Throughout the Mesozoic, however, bony fish underwent many changes toward the more modernized fish. For example, their tails did become more symmetrical. They also evolved swim bladders to regulate their buoyancy, and in terms terms of sharks, modern groups of sharks started to evolve in the Jurassic, such as the family of sharks that includes the modern tiger shark. Here's actually a reconstruction of one of its family members that evolved in the Jurassic. But fish were not the only large predators during this time. We already talked about ammonoids and belemnoids, and now we've talked about fish, but they were also what I called the sea monsters, which were so cool. So just like mammals in the Cenozoic era went back into the ocean after evolving on land, reptiles did the same in the Mesozoic. Likely the first reptiles that invaded the marine realm were nodosaurs, or nodosaurs, sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Uh, these had paddle-like limbs, but they were not fully aquatic. Placodonts were a little bit more fully aquatic, which you can see here look a lot different, um, but these guys actually included a variety of very different morphologies. Uh, but in general, they had blunt teeth for crushing shells, and they had broad armored bodies, and some of them looked kind of like giant turtles, but we'll actually discuss true turtles and when they evolved in a later slide. Placodonts and nothosaurs, however, did not survive the late Triassic extinctions into the Jurassic, but plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs did. Plesiosaurs evolved from nothosaurs in the mid-Triassic. However, these were more fully aquatic and had sharper teeth for catching slippery fish. And in the Cretaceous, a couple periods after they evolved, they actually got up to sizes of around 12 meters or 40 feet. Ichthyosaurs, however, beat this size. These were the most fish-like of the marine reptiles, and they reached up to 20 meters or 65 feet. Superficially, they resembled dolphins, but they had tails that were upright rather than horizontal. They also had large eyes for hunting prey in deep water, and since they were fully aquatic, they gave birth to live young. And actually, the way we know this is because some ichthyosaurs have actually been preserved in the process of giving birth to live young. As we can see in this fossil here, this mother, this poor, poor mother, got preserved in this moment. And so sad for her, but very cool for us when we you know, find things like this in the fossil record. And back to oxygen isotopes, we can actually tell from the isotope ratios of their bones, which reflect their body temperatures, that their bodies were much warmer than the surrounding water. That meant that they had plenty of energy to make long distance swims, even in cold water. But not all of the aquatic reptiles that evolved in the early Mesozoic are extinct. Early crocodiles evolved in the Triassic, and although they evolved as terrestrial animals, some were adapted to marine environments by the Jurassic period. And some could even rapidly swim, and many, just like today, hunted at the water's edge. And as you can see, they were absolutely huge. Because their prey was so large, they too had to be very large. They got up to 10 meters, or 33 feet in length. But finally getting to frogs and turtles. Turtles are one of my favorite things in the world, so it's really fun to talk about them. But anyway, both of these groups evolved in the Triassic, and frogs, like today, were pretty small. The oldest fossil resembling a modern frog is found in the Jurassic, but frog-like skeletons have been found in Triassic rocks. Turtles, on the other hand, were much larger at this time. Here's an example of a six foot long turtle. And as you can see, their tails were really long and they were a lot more elongated in terms of their body shape. And they also weren't able to pull their limbs completely back into their shells, meaning they were slightly less protected than many modern turtles. 
However, rounding out the Triassic period or the boundary just between the two periods we were talking about today, there was a mass extinction. Like I mentioned earlier, the late Triassic extinctions is one of the big five mass extinctions throughout the Phanerozoic Eon, as shown on this graph here in number four. This extinction devastated marine life and completely transformed the terrestrial realm. This is because dinosaurs who evolved in the Triassic actually benefited from this extinction event. That is because all of their land competitors completely either went extinct or majorly declined at this extinction event, and that allowed them to take over pretty much every single niche on land after the extinction event. But I talk about that extinction event as well as reasons for why dinosaurs were successful through it and after it in two separate videos, which will pop up here on the screen at any moment. I call this one debunking dinosaur misconceptions. Um, that was previously going to be called keys to dinosaur success. I'm still in between, but either way, it's kind of talking about why they were so successful. Um, and because it talks about that, it does hit on a lot of misconceptions. So I chose that just because it's catchier, but we'll see. I don't know if I'll stick with that. Um, if you guys want to check out my major reference for this and other videos in the historical geology playlist, you can check it out. It's linked in my description below called Earth Systems History. And you can also join my channel as a channel member if you'd like to get perks and extra content. Or for free, you can just press the like button, which I will also greatly appreciate. So anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!